All right, everybody, thanks for coming. So uh, I don't see any uh, new questions on the Google Doc since yesterday. I just checked one minute before I started the session. So do you have any questions related to the inheritance review lecture? You can now just uh, say it out. You can either type or you can uh, just uh, speak up about the questions. Yeah, if you guys questions maybe specific to the projects, we'll have three. I got office hour from 4 p.m. So that'll be the time to ask me questions. But for now, let's uh, now do the lectures. So Amir is sharing some insight over here. So I believe you might be okay. Uh, have not gotten the power of dynamic types because at runtime it is subject to violation. Yeah, I think uh, yeah exactly. So uh, what uh, at a runtime it's definitely easy to really get into uh, into violation. You know either because it got uh, you know just in general, not just for iPhone, just in general for OOP. So at a runtime, you might either run to exception because you got null pointer, or you might run into uh, exception because you uh, cast to the wrong type. So that's definitely something you would like to uh, avoid as a programmer. So it will be very important for you to really understand the logic for your program. So always, always uh, try to review your code before you try to run the test cases. Yeah, definitely you cannot really jump. Uh, the classes when you do the typecasting. So I think a, a very important intuition you want to gain from this uh, lecture over here. I'm not too sure if, uh, if that's how your uh, previous instructor uh, taught you about the inheritance. I think it's because you know, these things, uh, these details are very subtle and also very, uh, you know, many finer details you have to uh, understand. So I would say, so, so the best way to really understand is really understand the idea about ex uh, expectation. So once you really get an idea about expectation, so you will understand, for example, like yesterday, when I chatted about uh, this particular example, why you will actually get a runtime, ex uh, runtime violation when you try to cast the wrong type, simply because the cast type, simply uh, its expectation just cannot be fulfilled by the actual dynamic type, right? So once you understand the kind of the logic over here, so I don't think it will be too bad. What well, is the thing? If you want to program in a particular paradigm, like object-oriented uh, programming, in that case, you have to afford, you know, for the uh, possible violation. So that's why we want to teach you about the principles. How you actually practice that would be kind of up to um, your dedication, really. Right? Yeah, just a general uh, observation, general comments. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, we got an even smaller class today. So, uh, so we actually we got uh, many of you. I've seen you already from yesterday. Yeah, it's really nice to see you again. So, Jiahao, are, are you okay for the quest? Uh, are you okay with the lecture? Good. All right. How about Nina? Are you okay? Okay. Very good. Okay. Everybody seems to be shy. How about Nora? Okay, good, all clear. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. I would tend to believe your fellow students couldn't really make it because maybe they found the materials clear. <laughs> I really hope. How about Ving? Are you okay? You're good. Okay, very nice. Very nice. Okay. We might see some new name over here. So, Sabrina, are you okay? Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, okay, let's see. Okay, let's see this. We have uh, one question from Mohammed. Uh, question regarding inheriting methods from parent classes. So do you want to be more specific about what questions you have? Or you want to I can speak, speak professor, yeah. Please um, go ahead, so, yes. What's your what question? Yeah, so basically we had a question for the quiz where we had class A and class B, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there was in class B, there was I equals to um, some certain, like say I plus four, right? Okay. 
and then we inherited the method from class A using the precursor. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I for uh, and class A also had like I plus um, let's say five, right? Okay. Now I was just wanted to um, wanted you to go in depth about the scope of each. Um, uh, you know the classes that the methods that we call right. So I thought that we should uh, for when in inheriting uh, question like from class A, mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't it have its own scope where everything happens and then return a certain value which should not uh, you know collide with okay. uh, the, the variables in class B for yeah. example. So. Sure, no problem. I can understand your questions. So I think I will try to give you a slightly different example today. Um, but I think that to really uh, the quiz question, I believe you're referring to quiz number six. Uh, you may want to look at, I forgot which part, but you can look at the timestamp from yesterday's recording. Uh, you will see there's one part where I went over the uh, answer for one of the precursor questions. You can take a look as well. But let okay. me give you a new example, okay? I think that Mohammed might be uh, just confused about exactly how objects are really should be visualized and also how the, uh, what's the scope of the inherited variables. Okay, let's talk about it. Let me just give you a new example. So let's see, uh, let's say this, if we have class, let's say, let's say ABC, okay? Let's say class A, and then let's say we got I of type integer. And then let's say we have some routine or method. Let's say, uh, let's say routine A, okay? And then let's say it does not take any, uh, let's just make it simple. Let's say it does not take any parameter. And then it will simply just uh, return a string. Okay, and then over here, of course, we're gonna return something over here. Uh, let's say the result is simply assigned to, uh, basically, let's say it's uh, from A, so I'd say A dot RA, right? So just to uh, show you. So you can think about this is the very first version for RA. Okay, and then, so this will be uh, class number one. Okay, let me just put it like that. Okay, uh, let's, let me just, uh, first of all, introduce just one, <coughs> excuse me, I'll introduce one more class and then I'll do another class. Okay, let's do one at a time. So let's say we got another class over here. Let's say class B and class B inherits, okay, uh, inherits. A, okay, so it's a child class. So now let's say we simply say J of type integer. Okay, and then what we can say is, uh, let me say this. Let me say RB over here. Let me do RA and RB, so both of them. So I think two classes should be sufficient. Let's say we got RA. Uh, of course, after the inherit, since I'm trying to somehow redefine uh, the definition for RA. So I should really say redefine over here. Uh, redefine RA and also and, right? So these are all keywords over here, okay? Just uh, to remind you. And then RA is of type string. And then over here, let's say do and n. okay? So now let's say we try to call precursor and then we'll try to trace the code precursor over here. Uh, actually, you know what, let me say this. Since it's going to be returning a string, so let me just move this a little bit down. Let's say the result, first of all, is assigned to, uh, let's say, precursor. And precursor, uh, I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. And then let's say plus, it's, it's gonna be concatenation. And then I would say I dot out plus j dot out, okay. Okay, so that would be the second class over here. Okay, actually that's not very good. Okay, let me just try one more time. Okay, I think that's better. Okay, so let's say we got class A and class B. And now let's talk about what's gonna happen in the runtime. Okay, let me just make this a little bit smaller. Okay, very good. Like that, all right. Apparently this inheritance relationship between them, let's just remind you. Okay, like that. All right, so now let's think about the following, okay? Um, I think that the first confusion we want to clarify is this. 
So now you can see that, let's say we are now in the context of class B over here. And then we, of course, we simply say inherits from A. So that means every feature, including attributes, uh, query, and also commands, everything that's actually declared in your parent class, or in general, all the ancestor classes, there, all the code is simply accumulated into the current class. That's number one, right? That's something we said uh, in the beginning of uh, lecture seven. And then, so that means it's as if you actually declare these two uh, features also in this class over here, it's as if. So that is why over here, when you uh, look at this line here, so this line here would be valid. It's simply, simply because uh, I is simply inherited from A. Inherited uh, from A, right? So that could be part of your confusion, could be. So you can definitely try to, you can definitely make use of every feature that's actually inherited from your ancestor classes, okay? That's uh, in general, in principle, okay? There might be, there, there's some more advanced usages which I didn't talk about in the lecture, so you don't have to worry. In IFO as a design language, they also support another keyword rather than as opposed to redefine, you can say undefined. Undefined simply means I'm inheriting some feature from my parent class, but I simply don't want it. Okay, so this uh, is something that I'm not sure, uh, maybe we'll talk about it maybe in a later lecture, but for now, you don't need to worry, right? All you need to know is when you try to inherit from a class, you may say redefine to simply overwrite a method, which uh, pretty much like uh, what you did in Java, okay? So now, uh, so this uh, feature here is simply just in the scope. Uh, Muhammad, since you talk about a scope, so do you think this might be part of your confusion before? Like uh, you can, uh, if you can use all the uh, features inherited from the parent class. Just want to double check with you. Do you think that this might be okay for you for the scope? Okay, very good. Okay, okay. Assuming that you're okay with this, so I would say let's now move on a little, uh, a little bit. Okay, I simply don't really have the space, but can we make the following a little bit uh, sketch, right? Just make some assumption. Let's say over here, we have a constructor make, let's say, okay? And the make is actually going to take some new i. And then that one there is simply just going to initialize i. Let's uh, make that assumption, right? I just don't have space uh, to write it out on my page. And similarly, can we also make assumption that over here, you're simply just going to say make over here, which is also going to be a constructor. In which case, it's going to be maybe uh, uh, simply new j. Okay, it's going to initialize J. But this make here, I'm going to make it uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, detail over here. So over here, I can say precursor, let's say five. And then I can say J is assigned to new J, right? Okay, so that's about the, uh, the two classes. Okay, let's now do a little bit of testing over here. Let's say in the, uh, in the clients, I simply declare, let's say two variables. Let's say we got, you know what, let's declare just uh, yeah, two, two variables. Let's say we got objects one and also object number two of type A, statically, right? Let's now do the first one. If I say creates, let's say, uh, if I simply say A, dot make okay if I do that and then uh, the make apparently is going to take one parameter and then I would say five okay and uh, you know what let me use a different number what about 23 okay let's do one line at a time so Mohammed I have a question for you okay in this case um, which version of the make are we calling apparently we got two versions of the make which one are we calling the version of A from A or from B? Class A version, right? So now, of course, this one will be quite easy to judge, okay? But anyway, so the worst version that will take is basically depending on the dynamic type, right? Okay, just keep that in mind. So apparently it's going to call this particular version here. So that'll be quite straightforward, in which case you will only, you would simply just initialize the I by NI. In this case, it will just be 23. So now what's gonna happen is you might it you will be worth to actually do a little bit of visualization. What's gonna happen is option number one, uh sorry, I forgot to do something here. Okay, my bad. So when I say I want to create it, so now let's say I want to create for object one. Object one 
stomach. Yeah, so that'll be the correct syntax, okay? So after this green line over here, what's gonna happen is, so object one is basically pointing to an object dynamically is going to be A, okay? So it's going to be A. And now we wanna think about what attributes, what features can be included in A. In this case, it will just be I and also RA. And typically when we draw object diagram, we don't really include any routine. We just include the attributes because those will have some value, right? So I'm gonna put I over here. And now because I put 23 over here, and our, our assumption is 23 is going to be used to initialize the I. So that'll be just 23. Okay, this one is very easy, right? And now it shouldn't be too surprising to you if I simply say object one, if I write this expression over here, if I say object one dot RA, it should be quite obvious because, well, now uh, you can see we also got two versions of RA. We got version number one and also version number two. According to dynamic binding, we're going to call the version that's according to the dynamic type, in this case, just A. So I'm gonna call this version here, right? The similar judgment, as you said, uh, for the constructor. So now what's gonna happen is we're going to call the RA that's over here. So that one there is simply just going to return. So when I say uh, uh, dash uh, greater than, so that means simply means return. It's gonna return the value like an A dot RA, right? Okay, so this is just a warm up for us, right? So hopefully this fragment of code is okay for you. Okay, that's the first one. Let's now do a slightly uh, more sophisticated scenario. Let's say I want to do, let's say creates, okay? Let's say I want to use object number two. You can see object number two share the same static type as object number one, they're both A, right? That's the main intention. So now I want to say, now the dynamic type, I'm going to put B rather than A, okay? And then I'm going to say object number two dot make. And then obviously uh, applying the same reasoning, since now we are saying that we are going to put uh, B over here, right? B will be the dynamic type. So dynamically, we're going to call this version here instead, right? So which version of the routine you're going to call at the runtime is definitely to do with the dynamic binding, in which case you have to see what the dynamic type, dynamic type is. So in this case, we're going to call this version over here and then uh, we're just going to pass, let's say, also 23, let's say. Let's say we also pass the 23, and let's see what happens, okay? If you say 23 over here, and then let's visualize this. So what's gonna happen is object number two is actually pointing to uh, dynamically some objects of type B. And now, how do we visualize uh, objects uh, of type B, right? So apparently you got this particular new attribute J already. So J should be included for sure. J should be there. However, we should also include all the, uh, all the features inherited from your parent class. In this case, we should also include I. So when you talk about scope of the variable, so the, uh, all the variables inherited from your parent class or answers the classes, they should be included in the scope as well, right? So we also got I over here. So you can see, strictly speaking, you can see this is the uh, descending class, and this is the, uh, well, think about this is one class, this is its, it's, uh, its descendants. You can see the, the expectation is strictly wider than uh, what's in the uh, original class, right? Compared with its descendants. Again, let's uh, reaffirm our points in the lecture. Okay, let's now try to trace this code over here and see, let's see what happened. So now, if you say uh, make, so first of all, you say precursor. Whenever you say precursor, you can only use precursor if your class actually inherits uh, this particular routine from other class, basically, right? You cannot simply say this is a new feature, but I simply just, uh, actually, uh, simply just, uh, uh, oh, so let me uh, say it again. You cannot say in the, in the new, for example, R, if I say, let me give you one example right away. Let's say in the class B over here, right? Let's say I simply say RC over here, okay? That's a completely new feature. However, I simply list over here to say, I want to redefine RC. So this will not be considered as okay because RC was not inherited from anywhere else. It's just a new feature at this level. So you can just define RC uh, as you like. You don't need to say you're redefining that, right? Just give you one counter example. Okay, very good. And now let's see this. Uh, so when we call the make over here, First of all, we say precursor. So that means we're going to go into the parent version for the make over here, right? So this is the parent version, okay? You can think about this is a parent version. 
And the parent version over here, so we, we're passing five over here, right? Just notice the color here is five, right? So now when we call the precursor with five, so that means we're going to inherit, oh, sorry, we're going to initialize the I over here. You can see the I, right? That's, a, that's the attributes over here. That's inherited from the parents. In this case, it's going to be five, okay? And then after that, we're going to execute the next line. The next, the next line says J should be assigned to whatever NJ is. NJ over here is basically the 23 over here, right? Okay, so that'll be 23. Okay, hopefully so far you're okay, right? I'm just trying to show you how you can make use of uh, the variables. Okay, let's just do one more thing, okay? And now if I try to say uh, OBJ2 dot RA, okay? So now again, uh, actually already mentioned that in the chat, which version are we calling? Well, which, which version of RA is being called depends on what the dynamic type is for ob object two. And apparently it's simply just B. In that case, we're going to call this version over here. And now let's see again the scope. So it's going to be number one, we're going to call precursor, okay? So the precursor over here is actually, okay, it's going to return some value over here. Let's be precise. First of all, when we call precursor over here, we're basically calling the parent version of RA. And that one there is going to return just this string verbatim, right? So it's going to be uh, A dar R A. This is from the uh, precursor, okay? From precursor. And then we're going to say I dot out. So I is basically five over here, right? So it's gonna be, uh, you can think about, we're gonna uh, plus, plus the string five. Okay, and then plus, and J dot out. J is basically 23. Okay, if you combine all these together, it's gonna be A dot R A, five, two, three. Okay, that's the final answer. But the actual answer is not really important. I'm just trying to show you how we can uh, use, uh, you know, different variables, okay? We have a follow-up question for Amir. Can, can, can the make from A and B have different formal parameters? No, you cannot. That's a good question here. For example, you can, uh, you can definitely try this maybe when you're developing your lab three, uh, the final stage or your projects. If you say, for example, class, let's say again, class A, and then, well, you can do the constructor as well. If I say RA over here, let's say I is of type integer. Okay, let's say this is one class, and then we have inheritance, Let's say we got another class, let's say class B. There are different ways you can, you can violate this. Well, put it this way. The only way this is going to work, let's say you say inherits uh, A, and then let's say you want to redefine RA, okay? Let's say that. And now the only thing this will work for compiler would be, you gotta say RA. I integer, it has to be exactly the same. The number of parameters should be the same and each parameter type in the corresponding position should have the exact same type. So now if you, for example, for example, how can you violate this? For example, if I, if you simply change this from integer into, for example, uh, let's say a uh, real, for example, it's not going to compile, right? Or if you say you're just going to introduce another variable, maybe J, of type string, that's also not going to work. So the formal parameters must be exactly the same, okay? So Mohammed, does that kind of answer your questions from the previous example here? Yes, it does. Just okay. one more follow-up question. Go ahead. So if we have two, uh, like the same variable names, mm -hmm. um, so for example, precursor has the, um, uh, the variable I and my meth and the, for example, in class B result yeah. has like precursor plus I and precursor also has I in its method, right? So when I do I plus I, like, will they be considered the same variables? Like, uh, uh, okay, let me, uh, let me try to follow you more closely. Can you say it again? Are you trying to say in this, you're talking about this fragment over here, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which, so, which part are you talking about? Which part? So let's, um, over there, if precursor has, um, for example, in the precursor method, which is A, Mm -hmm. And there, the result is, for example, I, I plus I, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in class B, a result is equal to precursor plus I again. Okay, uh, I, I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah. There we so. go. Okay. 
Uh, I think this one, yes, I can definitely try to amend this example here to address your concern. But I think for a slightly more complicated example, you can look at the quiz discussion yesterday as well. Okay. okay. Uh, let me just, okay, let's say this. Let me expand the example just a little bit. Okay. Can we say now for the result over here, let's say we simply say A dot R A, let's say plus I dot out, for example. Of course, you cannot say J dot out because J only exists in B, right? Let's say this. If that's what we do, let's think about what's going to happen. If we say I dot out over here, and then we're still trying to do the same uh, R A over here, right? Let's say we're trying to call that. And then we're going to call this version over here again. So now when we say precursor over here, okay, let me just write it down over here. So the precursor now is still going to call the precursor version in the parents. Uh, and now A dot R A, okay. So you were asking basically which I it is going to call, right? So I would say this one, think about what a context object is. When we call the RA, the context object is simply just object two. So which means whatever we're gonna do is going to be relative to this context objects. So it's really object two over here. That one there only has one I. So it is this I that we are, we are really changing. You might be thinking about, are we changing this I over here? No, because uh, this is really, if this it belongs to object number one, which has nothing to do with object number two. So maybe that's what your main confusion was. Yeah, yeah, yes. I got it now. Thank you. Okay, very, very good. So I think, uh, Mohammed. So you want to make sure whenever you see that, want to see what a context object is. Okay. So now that means I over here would just be five. Okay. I just mentioned that, and also precursor is going to call this one here and then I that out, and this I that out will also be five. Okay. Just this five over here. All right. Okay. Good. All right, guys. Any more questions? I think knowing about precursor is very important. Yeah. You're welcome. Manor, are you okay for lecture number seven? You haven't had a chance to watch the lecture video. Okay, maybe you want to catch up uh, quickly. And then, yeah, if you can uh, finish them by tomorrow, you can still drop by my office hour to ask me questions. Yeah, you may want to catch up. All right, good, very good. No problem. Oh, by the way, guys, I think uh, uh, some, some of you actually asked me about for the exam. So as, you, uh, as you, may, you may have seen on the register website, I think our exam has been scheduled to uh, sometime in December, I forgot, maybe December 20th. Uh, don't quote me, I remember something like that. I'm gonna make a formal announcement later. Uh, I think that we do have some time after the last day of class and then to the exam, we can, we can hold some review sessions for you to, just to help you on your exam. So we'll do that, okay? But it's, not, it's too, still too early, so I'll get there once we are closer to the time. All right, so uh, I will hold on for a few moments, uh, just in case you got more questions. Yeah, so I think if you haven't really got a chance to review the uh, lecture videos, you may want to catch up, and then I still got office hour today and tomorrow, so can uh, feel free to come by. Okay. Hello, Jackie. Hi, Robbie, questions? Yes, uh, about the smartphone example. Uh, is it polymorphism or? The smartphone. A smartphone, yes. Which part? Uh, the diagram. The diagram. Uh, you mean the inheritance diagram? Yeah. Okay, let me take a look. Robbie, give me a moment. Uh, If you say the inheritance diagram, let me just go there first before we can uh, speak more closely about it. Uh, give me a moment, let me find it out. Okay, Robbie, the diagram, yes, what about it? I think it be valid to catch a galaxy as a 10 into as a 10 was. Good. I, Robbie, I cannot hear your question, yes, but before I answer precisely, let me just copy this guy over here and then just open a new page. I think uh, everybody can share. Okay. So I believe Robbie's question is really about typecasting. Okay. So Robbie, uh, you were asking about can we actually cast from Galaxy S10 
into Galaxy S10 Plus. Is that what you what what you were asking? Yeah, so because it's the features are the same. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. That's a good question here. Okay, let me set it up and then I will uh, answer that to everybody. The sh uh, guys, let me uh, state the question formally first and then I'll tell you what the answer is and then let's go about reasoning about it. So I can tell you that this question here is kind of similar to the very first one that we talked about yesterday. Let me just draw some connection to it. You can think about this more like an extended scenario about typecasting. Remember yesterday, uh, when we first started, we said that what if, hypothetically, let's say we still got our students' uh, inheritance hierarchy over here. For example, if we got rid of all the attributes or all the features from resident students, so that it only inherits name, courses, register, and tuition from the student class, right? That's what we said yesterday. In that case, will RS assigned to S still be invalid? Even uh, because given that, so now the expectation for now for resident students is just the same as uh, the expectation for students. The answer is this will still be invalid because as far as the compiler is concerned, as long as you're talking about substituting a descendant class by its ancestor, it's simply not acceptable because even though at the moment you don't have any uh, extra expectation, but you cannot guarantee maybe in the future Maybe you want to extend this particular class with maybe premium rates. In that case, whatever you allow previously will not be valid anymore. So you're kind of creating uh, lots of inconsistency in your code. Okay, so I'm just uh, summarizing what I said yesterday for the beginning part. You can definitely rewatch that part of the video. So now what Robbie is asking is basically following the same logic. So let me just explain that. Okay, so that's more like a review for from yesterday. Uh, let me set it up over here. Let's say let's say this. Uh, Let's say we have, let's say, uh, my statically smartphone. Well, I can just say Android, that's okay. Let's say I really, uh, I only accept nothing but Android, let's say. Okay, so first of all, you can see, as soon as I do this, you can see the static type is just Android, right? That's a static type. Okay, let me just use the green. Static type. Okay, so Rodney was asking, can we cast from Galaxy S10 into Galaxy S10 Plus? Okay, so I think what, what Robbie really meant, let's say dynamically, the mind is really a Galaxy S10, let's say. So what's happening over here is, let's say we have some creation procedure. Let's say I simply say creates. Let's say I want to create Galaxy S10. Okay, dot make. And then uh, let's just say uh, it does not take any parameter. Okay. Uh, okay, actually I forgot to say here. Okay. So it should be mine, right? We're talking about the same variable, dot make. Okay, let's say we take some argument, but the value is not important. All right, so over here we're saying the dynamic type should be Galaxy S10. So you can think about this part over here in the hierarchy, this is the dynamic type. Okay, so far so good. Apparently this is uh, acceptable because the dynamic type uh, over here, the dynamic type over here can definitely satisfy all the expectation on Android, right? Because you got strictly, you may just get strictly more expectation in the descending class. So now Robbie's question was like this. Given that the expectation between Galaxy S10 and also Galaxy S10 Plus, according to the diagram over here, you can see that size sync is simply inherited to both classes over here. And I don't seem to indicate any new features in this class, nor did I indicate any uh, extra features in this class. It seems like these two uh, classes have the same expectation as far as I can see right now, right? So now, would, would it be a, a violation at the runtime if I try to cast this particular variable, uh, this particular dynamic type into this one over here? The answer is you will. Okay, let me write it down over here. So now, if I try this, so now let's try a cast. So I simply say, uh, let's say, let me just use a check ex uh, assertion. If I say check, 
I want to cast into, let's say, Galaxy S10 Plus. So Galaxy S10 Plus. And then, oh, sorry, I forgot to say attached. Attached, okay, attached their particular type. And then over here, I would say mine. S. So maybe I'll just say new phone, just MP for new phone, okay? Then, okay, so now you can see that this part over here is really the Boolean expression that we would like to study, right? If this Boolean expression happens to be true, so that means the cast will be okay. There will be no violation. If this particular Boolean expression will be false, in that case, uh, it's gonna be a runtime violation, right? So this is a Boolean expression. Okay, so now let's be more precise over here. So now you can see we're trying to cast into this particular type, which is exactly over here. So this is basically the cast type. So now we got three types over here you, have, you gotta worry about. We have the static type, we have dynamic type, and also we got a cast type, okay? Number one, this is a valid cast because you're trying to do a downward casting. The cast is simply a descending class of the static type. So it's a downward casting, right? We also mentioned that in the lecture. So now, should this be true or false? Okay, I guess Robbie might want to argue that this should be true. Okay. True because at the moment, so I want to emphasize just at the moment. At the moment, right now, Galaxy, oh, let me just be uh, consistent with the color over here, right? So the, the dynamic type, Galaxy, uh, Galaxy S10. At the moment, Galaxy S10, and also the cast type, which is uh, Galaxy S10 Plus. Galaxy S10 Plus. have the same expectation. So this is a big question mark. Should it be true just because at the moment they have the same expectation? Okay, so Robbie, the answer to you right now, no. It should be false. So you should, you should really think about for the compiler, the compiler actually doesn't really check to see what features you really declare. In, uh, in these two classes to see if, uh, if currently they happen to be the same expectation. It is true, however, that's not how the compiler works. What a compiler will do is really like this. As long as the cast type is not really along the ancestor path of your dynamic type over here, meaning that it's guaranteed if the cast type is along the ancestor path over here, that means uh, whatever expectation for the new cast type, for example, here, here, or here, is guaranteed to be satisfiable by the dynamic type. If you simply say put a cast type over here, even though at the moment they have the same expectation, but you cannot guarantee, maybe later, let's say maybe a new slightly uh, updated version for this particular class over here. Let's say later, uh, maybe a, a few months later, if you simply add just another functionality, I'll just say F1. Now F1 cannot be satisfied anymore by this particular dynamic type. In that case, whatever you allow previously should be disallowed. Again, we are creating inconsistency. So the, uh, to recap, whenever you want to decide whether a particular type can really satisfy the expectation for another type, you don't really figure out exactly what the accumulated features are at the moment over here, and also what the accumulated features are in this class at the moment, and compare them to see if they're, they're the same set. That's not a way to go. All you got to do is only look at a hierarchy uh, tree that it belong to. Can this particular class satisfy this? It will only be possible if this particular class is actually, oh, sorry, let me say it again. Can this class over here satisfy the expectation for this class? That's a question. It will only be possible if this particular class is actually a descendant of that particular class. That's the only way that can be satisfied. At the moment, they're simply just sibling, so that's not possible. So, Robbie, does it uh, is it clear to you about the answer? Uh, 
Very good. Okay. Yeah. So guys, I think uh, it's good. So I think uh, uh, if you link uh, this particular question over here, let me just uh, emphasize again. If you uh, link this question over here together with the very first one uh, from yesterday, they are basically the same question. The question is, let me just uh, just do one more new page and then I might take some new question here. A here, B here. Let's say just F1, okay? So now, can B satisfy the expectation of A? Okay, so now, oh, sorry, let me I put it, uh, can B satisfy the expectation of A? Yes, because B is a descendant class of A. So this part here is really about the uh, substitution rule that we talked about, right? Okay, so you can definitely say, for example, you've got object A of type A, object B of type B. Can you say, OA is assigned to OB. So this will be okay because you can definitely substitute OB for OA because everything that you declare uh, B is guaranteed to satisfy all the expectation for A because it's a descending class. On the other hand, can you say over here, let's say OB is assigned to OA. So this will not be possible, okay? However, even though Right now, again, at the moment, right? Just right now, both A and B can both support F1 because F1 is simply just inherited to B forbidden. And also B has no new features, even though that's the case. The compiler still does not does not allow, okay, let me just move this down a little bit. Okay, so these two uh, important points, just to summarize uh, the previous two questions, uh, does not allow A for substituting B, right? So you can, you can see A is cannot be used to substitute for B, right? Okay, the, the, really, uh, the, the very reason is because B might be extended later. Okay, so that's a quick summary. So that's something you want to uh, uh, just make sure you understand that, right? But I would say typically when you create a new subclass, it will be quite rare if you don't introduce any new features, unless you only try to redefine some features, of course. Okay, right, guys, any more questions about this, uh, about this lecture here? So also to be clear that uh, from Robbie, dynamic type only matters for checking for runtime violation. Yes, so yes. So when you talk about, for example, uh, class, uh, class exception, like a runtime uh, violation for typecasting. Yes, uh, it definitely matters only for dynamic type to see if the dynamic type can fulfill the uh, cast type. Yes, that's correct. And also dynamic type will be important if you want to decide which version of the routine that's going to be called, right? That's also about dynamic binding. So dynamic types are mainly for these two reasons. Uh, I think, uh, uh, let me show you this. I we did summarize this in, uh, in the, in the, uh, at the end of lecture number seven. Let me show it to you. So if you simply go to the end of the lecture for seven, around the end. Okay, you can see over here. So that's basically the summary page you may want to review quickly. So we talk about uh, static type versus dynamic type, when to consider which, right? So you only consider static type when you talk about compilation, okay? Only about compilation. On the other hand, if you want to consider which version of the routine or method should be called versus 
uh, if you actually want to try to see if the uh, typecasting is going to result in a, a runtime violation, so these are the typical scenario you have to worry about, in which case you have to consider the document type. Okay, just to mention quickly to the notes, all right? All right, any more questions? Um, I have a question. Go ahead, please. It's kind of random, but um, for example, if class uh, C inherits from B and class B inherits from A, okay. if, I, if, if I said uh, like, if I said class C also inherits from A, so class C inherits from B, B inherits from A, and C inherits from A, would that compile? Question. First of all, you say C inherits from B, B inherits from A. First of yeah. all, right? Okay, yeah. good. If and I then, so apparently this is okay. Mm -hmm. You're saying, how about we say another one to say C also inherits from A. All right, let's speak about this. It's an interesting question here. Uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, first of all, let's ask, let me ask you this. Can you do this in Java? Um, I don't know. I don't okay, know. let's try, okay. <laughs> Think about this, you know, if you, let's say, if you wanted to do this synthetically in Java, what you're going to say is, you're going to say class uh, C extends, right? Whatever you want to say inherit, you will say extends. However, I think uh, whenever you want to do inheritance in Java, I'm pretty sure maybe your, your previous instructor told you that, you can only put a single class over here. You cannot put multiple. You can ask, for example, if, I, if you say C extends B and also extend from A, right? Yeah. So this would not be synthetically allowed, would not be. The only workaround you might want to have in Java, right, is to say, uh, if you say class C implements, right, you know the uh, difference between these two keywords. Basically, if I say implements, assuming that B and A, they are actually interfaces, in which case they only got signatures without any um, uh, implementations. In that case, this will be okay, right, just about in Java. But this is not very flexible because what if I do have some design scenario where I really want to say B is, does not just contain signatures like an interface in Java and also similar for A. But I really want to support to say C is really a descendant of both B and A. Okay? This is something called multiple inheritance. Okay? I would say only partially, very, very partially supported in Java. Only in the case where uh, the multiple classes you're talking about, they're actually interfaces containing signatures only, right? Only partially. However, for iPhone, as we emphasize, even though it may not be so popular as Java, but it's meant to be for design. In this case, they do support multiple inheritance. So to your question there, so you can definitely say C inherits from B and also C inherits from A. It is possible. Okay? Let me just say that here. And then I'll talk a little bit more. Class C you can say inherits uh, from A and also B. So in IFO, this will be okay. Uh, we will speak about multiple inheritance, inheritance briefly when we talk about a composite design pattern. And it's on schedule to be on week number 10. So we'll talk about this later. But you can do that if you wish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is if we can do that, and then uh, say that B redefines um, a method from A, mm -hmm. and uh, I called this method, I uh, inherited the method in C, and I called this method, which version would be called? So you're saying the, uh, the method with the routine you're talking about, you're talking about, you mean that, that routine, uh, the method is already here from A? Yes. Let's say that's effective. B okay. redefines it. Mm -hmm. And then? B redefines it. Okay. Which version would be called if C? Very good it? question. Basically, what you're saying is, let me draw the diagram a little bit better, okay? The, uh, the, the answer is you have to do something to resolve the clashes, otherwise you wouldn't compile, right? I think the reason that you might be confused because you don't know which version it's going to call. The compiler would just be as confused as you are, okay? So let's say this. Uh, let me just draw a little bit better. You're basically saying we got A and B over here, and then you basically got C, and C inherits from both A and B, okay? Of course, there might be some inherited relationship over here between B and A, that's not important in this discussion here. You're saying that, let's say F, 
let's say F, and also you got another maybe uh, F plus plus, but you or just in general, let's say A and B just happen to have the same feature with the same name, let's say, right? So now the problem is, so this, if you simply do this, this will not compile. Because A clash between the F over here that's inherited to C and also the F that's with the same name that's inherited to C. So it wouldn't compile. In order to make this compile, you will have to do a not, uh, you have to do some renaming. For example, you might say when, when the F is actually inherited to C, I'm gonna say I'm gonna call it AF. And when the F is inherited to C over here, I'm gonna call it BF. So that'll be uh, the uh, that'll be one way to resolve the clashes. Does it make sense to you? Oh uh, yes, yes. Yes. So can that you would, can you mm -hmm. new re redefine change the name of a function? You will. Uh, you mean which one here? You mean uh, you mean how to do this renaming? Uh, okay, so you will basically say something like this. Uh, let me just do a little bit more. Okay, let's say this. But we will we'll definitely go through this more formally. But since you ask, I'll just want to mention quickly. So what you would say, what you would say is inherit. Okay, so it's C inherits from A, and then you can say rename. Maybe rename the F as A F. And also, uh, also uh, N over here, pretty much like a redefine. And then you're gonna also inherit from B, and in which case you're gonna rename the F over here to be BF. Yeah, that's how you resolve name clashes. Uh, not too sure if you might need it for your lab three, but possibly maybe for the project since it's a little bit more complicated. So if you believe uh, multiple inheritance is the way to go for your uh, design, then you should really go for it. But whenever you, if you say a single class actually inherits from multiple classes as the parent class, you definitely have to uh, be, uh, be aware of the possible name clashes. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay, is it, is it okay for now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Okay, good. Guys, any more questions? All right. So I can uh, pause for another minute to see if uh, anybody want to have more questions. Otherwise, we can uh, call it earlier uh, finish. Okay. Let me just wait a bit. So with the rename a new keyword in iPhone. Yes, Robbie, we do have the rename keyword in iPhone, so that's a rename. But Robbie, don't worry too much about the rename for now. I think uh, once we get to week number 10, uh, not the coming week, but the next week. So once we get there, so I'll will, uh, I'll make sure I cover this uh, properly, the rename. I think for now, you don't have to worry about things. Whenever you want to say a class inherits from another class, that's okay. You, you may, uh, I think for now, for your lab number three, you don't need, uh, you don't actually need the multiple inheritance. That's why we haven't covered that yet. So you don't have to worry about uh, inheriting from another, uh, another second or third class. Yeah. So Robin, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, just uh, for now, just avoid using rename. That's what I meant, just for now. No, no, that's okay. I don't think that's confusing. I think uh, I think uh, you, you're gonna need that uh, at some point anyway. So I think it might be nice to have a preview. But for those of you who might be wondering, will rename be covered in your quiz number seven? No, okay, but don't worry about it, right? I just want to give you a little bit preview since your fellow student wants to know, right? All right, any more questions? Uh, let's see, okay. Manor, okay, uh, regarding the projects, uh, is it a general question or just about the game? Okay, uh, sure, okay. Uh, the question was about project phase one, okay, sure. Uh, project phase one. 
Uh, I don't have the instruction with me, but you can definitely refer to it. I think that there's one section there, I forgot which section it is. The section is called the grading criteria or grading scheme for phase number one, right? You can also look at that part, okay? So basically for project phase one, uh, your submitted code will be run against ato01.txt all the way to ato15.txt. So these are the 15 starter tests that were given to you uh, when the project was, uh, was released. Basically, you're going to, your code will be run against uh, these test cases, and then depending on how many uh, tests you can pass, and then you're going to receive the 2% or 1.5% or 1% accordingly. So basically, that's how, how it's going to be evaluated. So the first phase does not involve any documentation or report to be submitted. It's only for phase two, the ultimate solution, uh, the ultimate submission. But for phase number one, you just have to submit your ETF projects, you know, using the command that's uh, specified in the instruction. And then your code will be just be run. No surprise, only these 15 test cases that, was, uh, that were given to you. So we just want you to get a basic to be done. Uh, within the first uh, within the first uh, three weeks of your project released, so so that if you can pass all the fifteen uh, in the first three weeks, that'll be great. So that means for the remaining two weeks for your projects, you can try to do a little bit more advanced, uh, more thorough testing for other corner scenarios for your um, projects. Okay. So so Manor, is, is does it make sense to you? Is it clear to you about phase one? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there are uh, three. Yeah, there are three breakdowns for the project. Basically, about I believe one of them is if you can pass at least eleven uh, or more test cases out of fifteen, then you get a two percent. If you get I forgot maybe seven or nine, and then you get uh, the next breakdown. Basically, right? You can just refer to the grading scheme. I didn't memorize it, so I don't quite remember. All right. Um, yeah, for lab three, uh, so Amir, you mentioned that for lab three, you can have constructor with the arbitrary name. That's uh, absolutely right. Basically, think about constructors in IFO, the language, right? It's simply just by declaring a particular command with any name to be the constructor, yes. So this might help inheritance, sure. So you can uh, choose to see which uh, constructor or command you want to inherit so they can be reused as the constructor in the, uh, in the descending classes, yeah? Guys, any more questions? Yeah, so I would say uh, while you're being very busy with uh, other things, you definitely also want to take a look at the project as well. So for phase number one, there will, there will not be any uh, extra test that will be run for sure, right? As, a, as we said in the instruction, only, uh, only these 15 test cases will be run, only these 15, only, okay? Depending on how many you passed, you're going to get uh, the according percentage from the 2%, right? The 2% will be the phase one weights. So Manor, is it okay for you or you're still confused? We only run some extra test. Uh, very good, yeah. We only run uh, extra test on your uh, project code in phase number two, only in phase two. But in phase one, the, 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 main, the main intention for phase one is not to really give you some very thorough testing. It's really to kind of push you a little bit, just make sure you're on the right track so you don't have to rush out. You don't have to rush the, uh, your development in the last phase. Okay, so since like everybody is fine, right? Without any new questions, right? Okay, okay. seems to be the case. Yeah, yes? Uh, Robbie, uh, yes. When will you have a tomorrow? Oh, Robbie, oh, what, what do you mean? When will I? The lab, the project, when 
Oh, the project Q&A, I see. So uh, guys, I'll send you an email potentially uh, most likely tomorrow. So uh, in order to encourage you to really try to put, uh, put, uh, push, uh, put another uh, as much reading as possible in the first week. So I think uh, maybe most likely uh, next Wednesday. I found that maybe when I held a Q&A for lab number three on a Wednesday, more people can, could actually join. So that might be the more popular time for everybody. So most likely next Wednesday, and then I'll confirm the time for the Q&A for the projects. And then um, I think in the Q&A, most, uh, most likely I will maybe just go over some uh, overview for the game, uh, for, the, for the Space Defender 2. And also maybe I would simply just demonstrate maybe a few acceptance tests that were given to you, maybe the long ones, maybe, uh, maybe AT010, maybe uh, AT011, and then just run the Oracle in front of you to get some intuition. And, uh, but by then, if you got any clarification that's needed, you can always post on the forum. So I think uh, the TA or myself, we are always happy to answer that as well. But Robbie, to your question, uh, we'll get a Q&A, uh, most likely next Wednesday, but I'll confirm. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, so before next Wednesday, you may uh, just want to maybe manage your time to maybe just go over as much as possible about the documentation. You definitely don't want to take too much time uh, beyond the first week. Um, you know, to, to read. And then because once you have read through the document, have some idea, you will have to uh, start developing and then testing at the same time. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, it will be uh, running short of time for you. Okay, all right. Guys, any more questions, right? All right, sounds like we are okay for now. Okay, thank you for coming. And then I will call it a day and then I'll speak to you later. If you got more questions, I will be in my office hour around 4 p.m. All right. No future lecture are needed to start correct. Yes, that's correct. For to start a project, yes, that's right. So I think uh, uh, for the rest of the semester, we're gonna cover a few more design patterns. And also we need to introduce some concept about software verification also related to design. I think uh, you definitely wanna start coding your project as soon as you think you're ready. You don't want to wait for the design patterns. It will be expected later on if you find that while you, maybe uh, what you have done already should have been done using a particular design pattern. In that case, you can simply refactor. So that'll be the way to go. You don't want to wait until the final week for the project once you have learned about all the design patterns so you can start. That's not the way to go, right? So you definitely want to start right away. All right, so let me call it a day. No problem. Thank you everyone for coming. And then I will see you either office hour or just send me an email if you got any concern, all right? Take care.